<laughs> Tēnā koutou katoa. Lovely to see you all and thank you for coming. We've got a treat today. Um, we have Professor Barbara is Israel from the University of Michigan and this is the fourth time that Barbara has been in New Zealand. She's been a Fulbright Fellow. Um, she came first of all to um, speak with um, Professor Mason Jury at a Public Health Association um, talk. She's um, been involved with many researchers in New Zealand, uh, marked many theses to see if she can get away without marking theses this time. Uh, but I should, I should, um, she's at the Department of Health Behaviour and Health Education, and she previously was an editor of Health Education and Behaviour at the School of Public Health the University of Michigan, and she's also a director of the Community Academic Urban Research Center. Uh, she's involved in several community-based participatory research partnerships, and she's published a number of books, which she's kindly donated to our department, so come and see me if you want to read those. Um, and uh, her, particularly, she has, with her colleague, developed these ideas of research partnerships, and seeing that as that part of the research process that's really important. And she's, um, and she's examining and address, addressing health inequities. So, looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you. I should say she's, she helped us set up the Hekainga Oranga originally, so she's the closest that I had to a mentor. <laughs> <laughs> Very kind. Well, thank you all. Uh, kia ora, uh, mori ora, kia tarto. Uh, it's delightful to be here. It's great to see familiar faces and new faces, so I appreciate it, the opportunity. Particular thanks to Philippa uh, for, and, and Richard and others for allowing me to come over four years. As my spouse says, it's like the Haley's comment, we keep coming back. Um, and uh, again, feel very privileged to be able to do that. And thanks for Maria for all her help in organizing the talk. So I'm um, delighted to share the work that we're some of the work we're doing in Detroit. Uh, it feels really awkward for me to be here by myself. I never present by myself. My Detroit partner is here. You just can't see him or her. Uh, we always co-present, um, and which is a really wonderful experience for all of us and for the audience because you get to hear multiple perspectives. So unfortunately today you'll have to just listen to me. Um, but I do want to acknowledge them both with the Detroit Urban Research Center and the Healthy Environments Partnership that I'll be talking about. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna start with some rationale for why a community-based participatory research approach. So nothing new for anybody in this room, but I'll just do it quickly just to help provide the argument for the why, uh, provide some definitions, principles, a little bit about the Detroit Urban Research Center, and then I wanna talk about the Healthy Environments Partnership or HEP, um, as a case example. And even though I grew up in the Southern United States, I have a tendency to start talking really quickly. And so if I start talking so quickly, you can't understand what I'm saying, please raise your hand and I'll try to slow down. Okay. Um, but, uh, and I also have way too many slides and I know that, but uh, at a certain point, Marie's gonna tell me time, I have five minutes and then I'm gonna do five more minutes and then stop so we can have Q and A. All right, so even though I've done this a long time, I still uh, tend to put too much in a presentation. All right, well, thanks again. Let me just start by way of talking about some of the rationale for why a community-based participatory research approach. As you all know, um, there are numerous stressors in the social and physical environment that are associated with poor health outcomes. And the stressors include neighborhood conditions. These neighborhood conditions, things like lack of access to fresh, affordable food, lack of access to affordable housing, healthy homes, uh, exposure to violence, exposure to poor air quality, uh, just a number of stressors that people in communities face um, that are associated with poor health outcomes. Um, this burden of disease is borne uh, disproportionately by low-income communities and communities of color. But importantly, uh, First two minutes. It's important to keep in mind that there's an extensive set of skills, resources, and um, strengths that exist among community members uh, to address these stressors and to, to do things uh, to promote health, health equities. Historically, research has often not directly benefited and sometimes actually harmed the communities involved. Um, I guess his people are familiar with the Tuskegee study that happened in the United States, one of the most egregious examples. 
um, communities that are most impacted by these health inequities are the least likely to be involved in the research process. And this has resulted in an understandable distrust of and reluctance to participate in, the, in research. This was certainly true for our Detroit partners when we first got involved. Um, they really, it took 18 months before they were willing to say, commit to, okay, we believe you, we, we trust you. Um, and, but it's not just been research. Public health interventions have often not been as effective as they could be because they're not tailored to the concerns and cultures of participants. Um, they rarely include participants in the design and implementation of those interventions. And they've often focused on individual behavior change with less attention to the broader social and structural determinants that I was talking about. And again, individual behavior change programs are important, but it's also important to keep these broader factors in mind. And with all of this, there have been increasing calls for more comprehensive and participatory approaches to research. These, this is not new, CBPR is not new. This has been around since this, Kurt Lewin was the first to talk about action research back in the late 40s, and that would be the 1940s. Um, and uh, participatory research, participatory action research in South America, in Africa, um, and again, um, you know, so there is a strong history, but there have been growing calls for it, certainly within the United States, and increasing support for such partnership approaches, I'm glad to say, and that's been a lot, uh, a lot more funding from the National Institute of Health, uh, where they require partnerships now, which that was not the case 20 years ago. And community-based participatory research is one such a partnership approach. I'll refer to it as CBPR, or we'll be here all day. Um, and um, again, there are other labels. It's, it's not a new approach. Uh, but this is what we've come to, to use in our work in Detroit. So quickly, a definition. Oh my goodness, this is very sensitive. Sorry about that. So CBPR is a partnership approach to research that equitably involves all partners in all aspects of the research process. So real emphasis on equity and equitable involvement, uh, power sharing, resource sharing, um, knowledge sharing, um, it enables all partners to contribute their expertise with shared responsibility and ownership, uh, recognizing that everybody has expertise to contribute to the process. It enhances understanding a, give, a given phenomenon, so it is research. It's about what's your research question and how are you going to address that research question. But it's also about integrating the knowledge gained with interventions or policy change to try to bring about change to improve health status and achieve, in our instance, health equity. So there's a number of principles about of CBPR that I want to talk about. Importantly, there's no one set of principles. Uh, there's a lot of, in the literature, a lot of principles. Also, some that uh, there's some similarities, but some differences. Uh, in indigenous communities, there's some wonderful set of principles as well. Um, and so just want to go over a few of the ones that we uh, particularly try to adhere to. The first is recognizing community as a unit of identity. And by this, we mean that these, we're working with communities that have a shared sense of history, values, norms, culture, language. It could be a geographic community, but it doesn't have to be geographic. Uh, but again, this sense of identity is what's really critical. And that you're working with communities as part of a CBPR approach that have that sense of identity. Um, it also builds on strengths and resources. So you're starting from a strength-based approach and recognizing those strengths and building off of those. It promotes collaborative and equitable partnerships. And one of the important things here from a university faculty person's perspective is recognizing the disproportionate power imbalance, if you will, between academic, academia, between universities and communities. And we go into communities already with more resources that our institution has than community groups do. And so you're recognizing that from the very beginning. It facilitates co-learning and capacity building. Here, another point to clarify, often people think, oh, the community needs their capacity built. Well, I would argue the researchers need our capacity built as well. Um, I know how to do surveys, I know how to do evaluation research. I don't know what it's like to live in the southwest side of Detroit. Um, I don't know what it's really like for immigrants to deal with our immigration officials that pick up uh, parents while their kids at school and deport them before they get home late that afternoon. And this is happening right today. Um, and so again, recognizing that we both, all of us uh, need enhanced knowledge and skills. It balances research and action for mutual benefit of all partners. Again, the emphasis on mutual benefit. And it disseminates findings to all partners and involves them in the dissemination process. 
as I mentioned before, you know, we usually co-present, we always co-author uh, on the work that we do. So I, another thing that I think might be useful is to think about research on a continuum um, in terms of level of community involvement. So if you look at the middle top of this slide, issues around power and control, responsibility, ownership, participation, influence, that's really the dimensions along which this uh, continuum is set up. And on the far left-hand side is the idea of investigator-driven research, which I think we're all familiar with. Um, and I want to add, CVPR is not the only way to do research. It happens to be the way I do research. And all of these are really valid uh, ways to do research and to address research questions. So on the left-hand side, you have investigator-driven. You move a little bit to the right. That there, a lot of people do research physically in communities. So it's community-placed, if you will but without a lot of involvement on the part of the community in the research process. In community-engaged research, you're starting to ask people what their opinions are. You may or may not listen to them, um, but again, some level of engagement. And then continuing on to the right, there's more uh, shared power and control, responsibility, ownership, participation, and influence in CBPR and what we try to do. And then further to the right, community-driven research, where there may not be an academic researcher at all involved in the process, or the academic researcher may be a consultant to a community organization. And I think some of the Kaupapa Māori research that's done in this country, I would certainly put on that end of the continuum. So let me move now to talk some about the work we're doing in Detroit. So the Detroit Community Academic Urban Research Center, or again, Detroit URC, it's a long-standing CBPR partnership in the city of Detroit. We were established in 1995. Uh, I don't think that's before anybody in this room was born, but it is for some of my students, so I have to be really careful. Um, and um, we've really, our overarching goal has been to examine and address social and physical environmental determinants of health inequities and to engage communities in the process of trying to address those inequities through interventions, through policies, etc. Uh, we work, the city of Detroit is, um, quite diverse. Uh, we work within an African-American, Latino communities, uh, the Arab-American communities. Um, again, I don't have a lot of time today to talk about Detroit, but when we come to questions that people want to ask, um, I'll be glad to talk more specifically. Uh, in our 22 years of partnership, we are made up of a number of community-based organizations or NGOs, the local health department and integrated healthcare system and the University of Michigan, nursing, social work, and public health. Um, we have a board uh, made up of representatives of each of these organizations. We meet monthly, we have daily emails, it seems, um, and uh, this is the way we get our work done. Again, I'm not going to have time to talk a lot about our process, but these are, are the partner organizations. Um, and we see the Detroit URC as an umbrella organization because we're really about trying to foster the development of new CBPR partnerships and to do capacity building uh, for partnerships to help them uh, get up and running and be successful as a collaborative research partnership. So the, under this umbrella in this slide, these are four of our partnerships that we've facilitated and helped get up and running. The one I'm going to talk about today is uh, the Healthy Environments Partnership. Uh, later in May, I'm going to be talking about CAFE, our, one of our environmental health partnerships. Um, but that each of the partnerships has its own steering committee, its own governing structure, again, its own set of CBPR principles, um, but is working on very specific research questions, as you'll see when I talk about HEP in just a minute. Um, just quickly, a couple of the accomplishments of the URC as an entity. We've established 10 affiliated partnerships, implemented over 35 research projects. Importantly, we've been able to improve health status of participants in those interventions. We've increased capacity to engage in policy advocacy, which has resulted in policy changes. Um, we've hired over 400 community members for full or part-time positions. I'd like to say we started off with that goal in mind. I, I don't think we had any idea that we were gonna be able to do that, but it's turned out to be a really positive outcome of our work. Uh, we've built new relationships, uh, particularly, and if, again, if one of my Detroit partners were here, they would say this is the longest standing partnership and link between the African American and Latino communities in the city of Detroit. That prior to this work, um, those two communities really didn't work together. Uh, they're geographically in different parts of the city. Um, so that's been, and also linking universities and communities. Uh, the University of Michigan did not have a good track record uh, working in Detroit prior to this work. Um, other than to come in, collect data, and, and then disappear, as our, one of our partners say, refers to it as drive-by research. 
Um, so that's, uh, that was the history that we stepped into, if you will. One quick thing that's probably useful to know, the University of Michigan is in Ann Arbor. It's an hour by, by car to Detroit. So they are two totally different worlds, the two communities. So it's not like we're embedded physically in the community, which creates another set of, of challenges and issues for us to, to address. Okay, so on to HEP. Uh, it's a community-based participatory research partnership working to understand and promote heart health in the city of Detroit. The organizations listed at the bottom are the partners in the steering committee that guides the work of HEP. Um, what do we do? Uh, we examine aspects of the social and physical environment that contribute to inequities in cardiovascular disease, and then we develop, implement, and evaluate interventions, and more recently policies to address these inequities, again, specific to heart health. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the processes for participation and influence, given that that's really the, uh, what I'm trying to emphasize here. Um, we use a steering committee, as I mentioned before, meets monthly, lots of emails, uh, that makes, is the governing body, the decision-making body. Um, we also have subcommittees, so when we were doing our survey work, we had a sampling design committee. We had a survey questionnaire subcommittee that meets more regularly, but on a short-term um, basis. We get input from community residents, we do focus groups, we do town hall meetings, we, do, we had an intervention planning team, again, another way, layer of participation, if you will. And then we do a process evaluation of our own work as a partnership and self-reflection as another way um, to get uh, community involvement. Some of the HEP projects and data collected, we, from 2000, 2005, this was our first funded grant, NIH, Social and Physical Environments and Cardiovascular Health Inequities. Um, I'll be sharing some of the results from that. Uh, ended up, it was a major survey. This was the first partnership that the Urban Research Center agreed didn't have to have an intervention. So when we first started, this was a basic etiologic social epidemiology study. Um, and, but it was with the understanding and commitment that we would use the findings of this study to develop interventions and policies to address whatever findings um, came through. So that was the first five years. We then got funding for community approaches to cardiovascular health, which was 11 years of funding. We didn't get it all up front. It was three years, five years, three years, something like that. I think that was right. Um, and uh, this is what I'll be talking about today. And then Lean and Green in Motown was focused on the built environment um, and, and again brought in some folks from urban planning and architecture and, and that study that won't be talking about today. So the one thing with those studies, we've done focus groups, we've done youth photo voice, we've done surveys, we've done in-depth interviews, uh, we've done food grocery store audits, we've done physical space audits. Uh, so a lot of different data um, throughout these different studies that again, won't go into detail on all. I just wanna say a little bit about the two surveys. In 2002, uh, we did a random sample survey. It was stratified two stage probability sample. We wanted to oversample uh, people of higher income and whites because we wanted to be able to compare socioeconomic status with some of the other factors we were looking at. Um, I should say Detroit is 82% African American, 7% Latino, um, and the remaining percent, which isn't a lot, is white and um, some African and uh, Arab American. Uh, so it is a highly segregated city, one of the most segregated cities in the United States. Um, so we collected that data. That first survey was uh, 919 sample size. In 2008, we said after that survey, we'd never do another survey. 2008, we did another survey because um, we ultimately decided it would be really great to have the longitudinal data and to look over time. Uh, that, that sample was 467, 220 roughly of the same participants, another 220 who are in the same household, but different physical structure, but different participants. So what I wanna do now is share some of the select findings from some of this work, and then show how those findings have guided, guided us into our intervention work and the findings from that. So this was from some of this uh, survey data around food access, and I should say, with through all the early stages of the data collection, we, uh, food access was identified, um, poor air quality was identified, and physical activity, lack of physical activity spaces was identified. Today, I'm just gonna present some of the findings on food access and physical activity. In a couple of weeks, I'll talk about the physical environment. So here, the high percent of poverty and a high percent African-American were associated with reduced access to supermarkets, 
and reduce quality and range of produce. Uh, it, there's references here, if folks want to look at some of these published studies. Uh, the proximity to large grocery stores was associated with increased fruit and vegetable intake and increased, I love this dark green leafy and orange uh, <laughs> fruit and vegetable intake. Um, and not surprisingly, proximity to convenience stores as compared to grocery stores was associated with reduced fruit and vegetable intake. And you'll see a graph in a minute that shows you um, some of the challenges along there. This was a picture of, from our youth photo voice uh, from a, a young person of a closed supermarket. Uh, some of the quotes came from focus groups. We need a so supermarket, honey, someplace other than the corner store where they charge you 10 times what it costs anywhere else. Someone else said they just don't care what they put in the local grocery stores. It, it, I feel it's because we are black. The community is black. So we did, one of the things we did was a grocery store audit, both in terms of location and quality. So this is a map of, of locations. As you'll see, the purple square is a large supermarket chain. Uh, the others are the independents, mom and pop stores, et cetera. The top left corner is a suburb called Southfield. So the, the, the line across the, the middle is Eight Mile. If anybody's seen the movie Eight Mile, that is the border indeed of the city of Detroit. Everything in that movie is not real, but some of it is. Um, so what this shows pretty prominently, and Southfield as a suburb is much more affluent, uh, not as segregated, um, is that that's where the supermarket chains are. If you look on the east side, the right, the one on the, your right in yellow, there's about 150,000 people there, not a single grocery store. I mean, think about Wellington. You have so many grocery stores, right? I mean, Ann Arbor, where I live, has so many grocery stores. 150,000 people, not a single grocery store. Supermarket size grocery store. Okay, gives you a sense. Um, I will say quickly on the southwest side, I gotta hurry here, is um, where the, all those circles are across this, the middle, there, that's a road, Verner, which is a major commercial road. This is Southwest Detroit, is the area of the city where the largest percentage of Latinos reside. And these are all tiendas, local grocery stores run by um, local community members. And so they do have much more food access in Southwest. Again, they're not large supermarkets, but they do have fresh fruits and vegetables uh, in a way that East Side doesn't. Here's another youth who took a picture of our famous McDonald's that we have everywhere in the world now. In my community, there's no grocery store. You can't eat right if there's not good produce. It's easier to get a box of mac and cheese. So this was the same study that looked at grocery stores. This is looking at liquor stores. Look at the pattern here. Okay, exact opposite. So the east side has disproportionate amount of liquor stores as the southwest and, and northwest, but your suburb, Southfield has a lot fewer liquor stores. So some of the findings around physical activity was that sidewalks conditions were associated with physical activity independent of structural characteristics. So not surprisingly, if your sidewalk is in better condition, people were more likely to be physically active. Police presence, the presence of other pedestrians, sorry, absence of stray dogs, moderate traffic as opposed to no traffic, all were associated with greater participation use of the greenways. Greenways are come into the city in different areas that are built uh, primarily for people to use and to walk, but we were trying to understand why people weren't using the greenways. So we took all of this data and engaged in a very participatory assessment and planning process. So the first phase is what I've really been talking about, all the, the survey, the focus group, youth photo voice, we did the air quality and, and so forth. In the second phase, the community planning process, we took this data and it shared it in community settings, in town hall meetings. Uh, we had a, a planning team that was larger than our steering committee. So again, um, that, and that process took over almost two years. And then based on that process and looking at different intervention designs that were out there, had been shown as evidence-based, we developed a multi-level intervention and evaluation and also used this data to inform policy and decision makers. Um, so again, this was a very intensive planning process with our, uh, not only our steering committee, but broader community input as well. And so from that, the multi-level intervention, just want to say a little bit about um, that. Uh, it's really, first and foremost, it was about promoting walking, uh, but it's also been about promoting leadership and sustainability and promoting activity-friendly neighborhoods. So we use what's referred to usually as a social ecological model, 
uh, where it's recognizing that individuals are embedded in larger social systems, and that if you really want to bring about effective change, you need to think about not only individual behavior change, but individuals in those broader social structural contexts. And so that's, um, while I'm going to focus on the walking component, um, we did also do other activities I'll say a little bit about on leadership and, and creating activity-friendly neighborhoods. So the walk your heart, we call it walk your heart to health. Um, and it, promoting healthy heart environments and behaviors and walking being the one, providing opportunities for other heart healthy activities, doing things like food demonstrations and so forth. Uh, real emphasis on social support and also on creating group cohesion. Uh, based on a lot of the literature and our experience, recognizing, again, this is not just about individual behavior change, but how you can create the groupness to create the kind of support for this change. Um, the walking groups met three times a week uh, over a, an intensive period. Uh, I'll say something about that in a minute. And then a less intensive period. Uh, the evaluation, we did pre and post surveys of health indicators, uh, looking at social support, but also looked at body mass index, blood glucose level, a number of biomarker data, uh, pedometers to monitor steps. Turns out the pedometers were a huge success. People loved being able to see on the computer how many, because we did printouts, of how many steps they had taken since the last day and counting up all the steps and how many times around the world their group had been in the last six months. You know, I mean, it was, it was really an amazing motivator. I hate them myself. So that's why I was in awe that they think they're <laughs> a motivator. I'll just put that out there. Uh, we did participant observation, attendance, record summary sheets, so lots and lots of data, if you will. So the design, again, quickly, it was a, a staggered design, what we call a delayed or staggered design. Uh, from our perspective, is a CDPR approach, a, a traditional uh, randomized controlled trial where one group gets nothing, uh, doesn't fit with the values of uh, ourselves and the people we're working with. So a staggered design is everybody we collected data at time one. Uh, we did the intensive intervention for eight weeks uh, for one group, and then the other group, the lagged group, group, if you will, got the intensive intervention for the next eight weeks, and then the intervention continued for a total of eight months for both groups. Uh, but the, you know, the time one to time two, uh, we were able to, to use that group as the comparison group. And what we were able, some of the things we learned uh, in terms of physical activity, uh, that Walk Your Heart to Health participants walked more steps on the days that they walked uh, with the walking group, attended the session, but they also, after joining the walking groups, they continued to walk more steps in at baseline, even if they weren't walking with the walking group. Um, and not surprisingly, those who attended more sessions um, were more engaged in more physical activity, more steps. But a, a serious increase in steps um, as a part of this intervention. But in terms of reducing cardiovascular risk, this particular slide uh, chart is around blood pressure, but we found the same thing for um, the odds of, of having the high blood pressure, but also total glucose levels, uh, cholesterol, weight, uh, all of them were reduced uh, for every 4,000 steps that people walked. You saw a reduction in, again, blood pressure, uh, body mass index, uh, weight, and total cholesterol. And these reductions in risk factors uh, maintained after the eight weeks throughout the 24, additional 24 weeks following the initial intensive intervention. Um, what we learned also from our qualitative data, um, you know, folks said almost everyone can walk. Uh, a couple of quotes, I loved it. The people in the group and community health promoters, we became family. Um, everybody in my house walks. I changed my diet, lost weight. The program should never end. Um, and it was, it, it's really been an amazing, um, we had over 700 participants over the three-year intervention period. Again, I can point people to publications for more specific. One of the really promising things because of the positive outcomes, it's now become part of the evidence-based literature. NCI, the National Cancer Institute, just asked us to submit, which we have just done, um, a summary so that people can start to use it more broadly around the country. So um, we're really pleased about that. We hope that it'll also get into the Centers for Disease Control Community Services Guide of Evidence-Based Interventions. But not to lose fact, the fact that it was also about broader social and structural change. Uh, we created a network of organizations to support walking groups. 
Um, we do training, something we called swag training, which uh, was to be supporting walking groups and sort of attempt. And this is for people in the community that want to learn to be uh, facilitators of walking groups because we're really at a dissemination phase now where we want to, as our partners say, create a walking movement in the city of Detroit. Um, and we've trained uh, over 200 people as swag trainers uh, who have now in turn created walking groups in their own communities and faith-based organizations. Um, we've, been, we've had many grant programs where people could apply to do, for $1,000, $2,000 to do activities on the greenways, to do things to physically change a sidewalk if there was a dangerous part of the sidewalk. Again, all things applied for to change the physical environment. And then we've been doing policy advocacy and capacity building workshops to train our community residents on how do you impact policy, um, how do you use some of the data that we've collected to have a, uh, an impact on policy change. So I'm going to stop here um, and entertain questions. Uh, what I was going to talk, just summarize some of the sort of uh, recommendations for how you go about setting up a partnership but I'd much rather stop and hear what you all have on your mind. Okay, thank you, please. Oh, and if you'd use the microphone, please, uh, because this is being recorded and otherwise I'll lose my job. <laughs> and, and, and if you could just um, say who you are for Barbara and the people who are on the other end of the computer screen. Uh, my name is Matthew Shaw, I'm a PhD student. Um, fantastic work. Uh, my question is somewhat bizarre, but one I have a personal interest in. Um, so for, uh, apologies for that. Do you, philosophically, do you feel there's a difference between um, community-based participatory research and critical pedagogy as described by Paolo Freire? And what is your view about using the language and terminology of critical ped pedagogy? of using the language and, and terminology of pedagogy? So we do that sometimes. Um, uh, everybody heard the question. Okay, uh, clearly our work is based on a lot of Freire's ideas and theories and we acknowledge that in all of our writings. Um, the way we organize the work we do, the way we engage participants is also very closely tied with his pedagogy. We don't use the language per se. It hasn't resonated to the community partners that we work with. Um, that's, you know, some of my close colleagues who are doing work in New Mexico, working with Native American communities, they do use that language. So, it, you know, I certainly, I don't see it as a right or wrong. I think it's really sort of tailoring um, the work that you do to what's going to be viable language in the community you're working with. Yeah, but very much guided by his work, certainly. Yeah, <laughs> going up and down the steps. Hi, Ali Chisholm. Thanks for a great presentation, Barbara. Um, you mentioned that moderate traffic as opposed to no traffic is associated with increased people walking. Is that something to do with safety or what's going on there? And if there is safety issues, I've heard in these sort of vacant areas without many houses, is there anything people can do to make people feel safer? Right. Oh, there's a great question. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. It's a safety issue. If there's some, you know, if there's some people out and about traffic and people feel safer than if it's totally abandoned. If you look on this slide, just happen to have the right slide up. The picture in the middle is one of the things we did with each of the walking groups developed maps for their, where their neighborhood was, of what are the safest, most appropriate areas of that neighborhood to walk. And so here's an example of one of those. And so it really was consciously mapping out what are streets where people are more likely to be on their front porch or where there's gonna be some traffic and there's gonna be enough houses, not a, because there are certain blocks in a given neighborhood that there may be one house still standing on a given block. Um, so absolutely, safety was a big issue. Um, and one of, the, one of the real strengths of the group approach that people talked about was because people were walking in groups, they felt safe. 
Um, so this was not about an individual, you know, get people out individually to walk. That, that's not a real viable strategy in the city of Detroit. But people loved walking in groups. And also in the summertime, folks would come out on their porch because every each group came up with their own name. They had their own T-shirts, you know, their own water bottles, you know, all the usual things, right? And they would, people would come out on this, you know, because here goes 15 people walking by, you know. What is this, you know? And sometimes people, can I join? and um, that sort of thing. So it, it's really a critical component. Thanks. Other question? Looks. Oh, hi, I'm Caroline Fife. I'm uh, actually from Massey University. Just wondered, is there a strategy for sort of trying to keep the intervention going after you've moved away no, absolutely. So the last three years, um, again, this was a very fortunate funding stream we had from the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities has been our dissemination phase. And so that's when we've been doing the, the swag training and working with groups to try to get them up and running. Uh, we've also, we're working now on a, trying to develop a sustainability model. Um, Similarly, the uh, diabetes prevention program, which has been evidence-based and then got picked up by the uh, kidney, kidney or heart? Oh my goodness! Uh, take that out of the quote, out of the tape. Um, they, uh, um, we're trying to develop a similar sort of model to see that would be picked up by others through an organizational um, group that around the country nationally. So we've spent the last year working on that. With um, we've also been working with our a uh, couple of uh, healthcare systems to think about how they might integrate that in their day-to-day -day business. There's a whole thing with the Affordable Care Act called community benefits that they're supposed to do. Um, and so how might this be integrated into their community benefits package? So that's very much uh, you know, a, a, a lively topic. <laughs> and um, hopefully in another year, I'll have an, a positive answer to, to those things we're exploring. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a great question. <laughs> Kathy Nelson from Victoria University. Um, with the two examples you gave, you started with the um, supermarket and the alcohol outlet and finished with the exercise. I, Within the philosophy, is there something about what's community modifiable as opposed to uh, um, needing big enterprise to do the modification? That's a great question. I mean, I think the perspective, that, I mean, I know the perspective we take is let's see what issues are identified and then try to figure out what we can do about it recognizing, you know, I mean, poverty, of course, is a big issue in the city of Detroit. We haven't, although we're working now on some economic mobility projects, so it's not that you can't address poverty, but you're clearly not gonna eliminate it overnight. Uh, our, the work we're doing on air quality, one could easily say you're not gonna stop marathon oil from polluting the air, we know that. But there are things you can do to reduce the exposure. Um, and so it's really trying to, you know, recognize that you can make policy change. Um, you can, but you also, there's some things that are, you know, smaller bits that you try to make an impact on um, and not see it as an either or. Um, so I don't think we've ever taken on something that totally couldn't be addressed in some way, shape or form that people would feel good about. So I don't know if that answers the question or not. Yeah. Hi, <clears throat> thanks very much, um, Barbara. Great work. I just wonder, you made a comment about um, randomization, and I, I just wondered about the issue of sort of um, study design and intervention studies. Um, because, I mean, the, the sort of um, delayed uh, implementation design could have randomization within it. And oh, it is randomized. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, sorry. it's totally randomized right. control trial. It's just we use a lag design rather than a control group that gets nothing. Right. Okay. But I, I was really going to ask them what the broader question about how much in, in this sort of partnership working that, that you, you debate those issues of basic study design and the strengths and weaknesses and the degree to which the right. uh, communities are involved in those and, and can participate and, and maybe even those designs are uh, community-led or it's a partnership approach. I'm just wondering how much how that process plays out 
and yeah, yeah. how that works. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's interesting because I have some colleagues who do CBPR work other parts of the country that actually do like training workshops on Research 101 um, as a way to, in, you know, enhance capacity for community members to understand about randomization, p-values, and so forth, um, and have done so very effectively. Our approach has been to engage community members in the process, sort of a learn by doing. So for example, around the survey early on, I mentioned we did, we had a sampling survey committee, we had a survey questionnaire design committee, and people sat around those tables and said, you know, why do you have to have 100 questions? Nobody's gonna answer 100 questions. Well, why do you have to, this is the same question as that was. Why do you have to have four of them that are asking almost the same thing, you know? Um, and you have to get, what's a p-value, you know? And what difference does it make? What do you mean by significant? You know, so, and so all of that is part of the conversation. And the thing about, you know, the randomized controlled trial, it is a randomized controlled trial, but the staggered design, we had another, our Community Action Against Asthma had a year long, one group was randomized for the first year and the other group got the intervention the second year. Um, and so, you know, there was conversation, people, why do people have to wait a year? You're not gonna get data from them over that year period, this is ridiculous. And it was, again, it's an ongoing, we use a, what we call a 70% consensus decision-making rule that you keep talking about something till you can all agree at least 70% of yourself. Uh, so sometimes some of these decisions took months to reach. Uh, but I think people, you know, and some of our partners now, they'll say to us, you know, they'll ask research questions, research design questions that it was like, whoa, you know, I would never would have thought of that. But, you know, they've really become incredibly competent at, uh, although you, one, one person I'm thinking in particular who I spoke to earlier this morning on a conference call, you know, if you call him a community researcher, he gets really upset, you know, because they don't, they don't want to see themselves as researchers, you know, then that's really going over the line. Um, but they get really competent. I think, well, and I think, Graciela, did you want to ask a question since you're right there? Oh. Hello, I just wanted to say um, thank you to Barbara for being here, for coming from so far away to give us this amazing information and how formative Barbara and her colleagues, their work has been for professionals like me who work in the area of health education and health promotion and how far and beautifully they've taken the ethos of the Charter of Health Promotion and the role of communities within that document that is so important to us as public health professionals and implemented it with such, you know, commitment to including the people that we actually serve in the process of designing participatory interventions like this. I also wanted to say in regards to my colleague's uh, question in regards to the level of interventions and how to address the different interventions that are presented in this type of project. And I think that's where the value of the use of the socio-ecological model comes into light and how, you know, a problem has different manifestations depending on where we want to intervene or where we look at. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we have some questions from I have a couple of questions from um, Debbie Goodwin at Auckland University. Are there particular groups that have not participated so well in the walking groups, and how has this been addressed? In the what groups? In the walking groups. Walking groups. Um, not, I wouldn't say groups so much. Uh, probably, maybe not surprising. It wasn't surprising to us. Most of our participants have been women. Um, our, and so that's another challenge that we've faced to try to in, enroll men in the, in the walking groups. Um, the more recently in the Latino community, I alluded to this before with uh, the, the city of Detroit, people may not think about this, but we border Canada, which means we're a border town, uh, which means there's a lot of ICE presence, immigration uh, authority. Um, and they also, there's certain rules, if you're within 100 miles of a border town, they don't have to follow search warrant rules the way you, we do in the rest of the country. All of which is to say that a lot of our Latino um, undocumented as residents are afraid to leave the home. And so it's been a lot harder to engage them in the walking groups more recently because of fear and understandable fear. So that, that would be a group that's been more difficult. There's another question. Um, how hard was it to keep 
to your equity principles in all of the process? Mm -hmm. Were there particularly tricky times? <laughs> Great question. So um, we, we emphasize equity, not equitable. Uh, we can talk some about that if we have time. It, it is a challenge. It's something you can never let go of you, and you can never think you've gotten there. It's a goal and ideal to strive for. Um, we do, I think we do a lot better, a lot of it is resource sharing with our partners. So we've done a lot more, for example, like our Youth Photo Voice project. Uh, we, that was a subcontract to one of our community-based organizations. Uh, they ran the program. They hired the staff. They uh, identified the youth. Um, they ran the program with a subcontract from the larger grant. Um, and so it's really important to show that you're sharing resources. I mean, equity is not just about money, but, but it's a good start. Uh, so, but it's a constant conversation and, and thing to strive for. It's a great question. We have time for one more question. Uh, somebody taking a question? <laughs> uh, Louise down here. I just look. Wait for the mic, sorry. <laughs> Uh, Louise Delaney here at the University of Otago. Um, just an ultra minor question. Um, it's really pretty hard to organise groups in the sense of you know everybody being available at the same times. How did that work out with people in employment? And people in people working. I mean, did you have to yeah. if you, if you have to have things in the evening to cope with? I mean, sure, or sure. yeah, no, that's a great question um, as well. So uh, one of the things I didn't have time to emphasise: most of our partners are organizations, community-based organizations, as I was mentioning, some of them are quite small, others have larger budgets. And so it's the organization that's the partner, a given individual, often the, the Detroit URC level is the executive director, he or she will come to the meetings that are held during the day uh, because it, they, they see it as part of their work. It becomes part of their work, if you will. Uh, one of the advantages to that is these organizations are well embedded in their communities, highly regarded in their communities. If a given individual leaves the organization, we don't lose the partnership because someone else from the organization would then take on that role and responsibility. Um, we do have some individual members and, and that can become an issue, certainly. The other levels of involvement, though, through town hall meetings, through focus groups, all of those happen in evenings and, and Saturdays are trainings, again, to accommodate people's work schedules. So absolutely. Well, I don't, <laughs> I, I don't see uh, any other hands, um, but I'm sure there's lots of questions. And are you able to stay afterwards? But just we're sitting up at a table there to have lunch if people would like to um, join us. Um, but I want on your behalf to very much thank Barbara for um, a very stimulating and exciting talk and always um, always uh, inspires me to think about some of these ideas and, and, and research projects. And it's, it's lovely to hear, have heard it over a period and how it's developed. And I, I'm interested in the emphasis on institutions as a way of maintaining that kind of um, a momentum. Mm -hmm. So... I'd like you to join with me, please, in thanking Barbara.